Well, good afternoon. It has been quite a while since the last time I did a Pastor's Cut video. Uh, since then, we have finished the book of Isaiah at Redemption Hill Church, started the book of Colossians, and I've had a cold or some kind of sickness for the last three weeks. So I wasn't feeling too enthusiastic about talking a lot on video or things like that. But I'm getting better, and I thought, let's jump back into it. So if you haven't been at Redemption Hill Church, we've been studying the epistle that Paul writes to the church in Colossae. It's pretty short, very dense. And um, this Sunday I'm preaching from chapter 2, uh, verses like 6 to 15. And I'm just going to read one verse here. And this is verse 8. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, the idea of uh, stoicheia and being taken captive in Paul's uh, thought world. So chapter 2, verse 8 of Colossians says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits, that's a translation of this Greek word stoicheia, of the world, and not according to Christ. And that's all I'm going to read right now. It just struck me. The points that hit me were that Paul is warning them that anything not according to Christ actually has an enslaving, he kind of uses that captive language, has an enslaving power um, over our intellects, over our personhood, ultimately spiritually, sometimes politically, sometimes not so much. Um and I thought it was interesting how he first uses the two pairs of words. He says, by philosophy and empty deceit. And so, you know, he's standing in that Greco-Roman tradition, even as a Jewish man. He's born outside of Israel. Um, you know, Plato has already been there. Aristotle has come. You know, he's in sort of the grand tradition of uh, the Greco-Roman uh, culture. And he still uh, warns them very much against that idea of going to philosophy that's not according to Christ. Obviously, Paul's a very intelligent person, so he's not sort of um, encouraging them to turn off their brains. Uh, Paul, ne uh, what he writes next requires a lot of mental uh, acumen, actually, to kind of wade through. Um, but there is an emptiness to the philosophies of his day that actually becomes enslaving. And um, he kind of says it's, and then follows it up with two parallel phrases. According to human tradition, according to the stoicheia of the world. And I take that to mean that he's sort of saying, regardless of the source, these two ideas, human tradition on one hand, these basic spiritual forces, there's no great word for stoicheia in English. That's why it's translated a lot of different ways. Um, I think one idea we have today that they didn't have so much back then is this idea of sort of structures and substructures and systemic kind of powers in the world. Um, I think Stoicheia captures that a little bit, you know, where he's sort of saying like, whether the tradition be sort of straight out of the human tradition, you know, I mentioned, you know, Plato, Aristotle, whatever the human tradition might be, or whether it's kind of harder to pin down. Now, Paul, obviously, and I agree with this, even though it's very difficult to prove, right? It's improvable that there is a spiritual subcurrent to this world, which manifests in kind of cultural moments, in uh, structures that rise up uh, often very negatively, very powerfully, um, uh, and very persuasively at times. And Paul says, you know, wherever this influence is coming at your life as a believer, if it's not according to Christ, no matter the source, it will ultimately take you captive. And so that got me looking at two different groups this week. And this is where I really, <coughs> excuse me, don't think I'll have time to get into this on Sunday morning. I was looking at the Oath Keepers group, um, obviously politically on the far right, I didn't really know much about them. They're in the news. Obviously, they were um, just convicted of uh, sedition on January 6th, some of their leaders. And, um, you know, I discovered sort of their, their, their reason for being, right, is to try to create a sense of protection 
of America's core freedoms as they see them, um, which they believe absolutely requires the ability to have uh, an armed populace with mil roughly military-grade weaponry to be the militia that the people were, uh, in their minds, always intended to be. And so it's a group that has an enemy. The enemy is sort of federal government, um, the UN, anyone that might uh, seek to limit the control of guns, anyone that might seek to take over private property in the name of conservationism, things like this, right? Um, they would argue for the presence, you know, primarily at the federal level, but also at, like higher, maybe corporate, like super powerful elite groups. Um, they kind of toss out this idea that, you know, the government might be one day looking to mass incarcerate uh, all the people who would stand against them. And so this has a great appeal to people who um, consider themselves very American, consider these rights and freedoms just really essential to life, uh, to the fullness of life. And so Christians who walk into a group like this, right, they are at risk of being taken captive again because ultimately the Oath Keepers movement is not according to Christ. Right? It's not situated in Christ. It has nothing to do with his work on the cross. It has nothing to do with the gospel of freedom. It has everything to do with political freedoms, things that many of us believe are important, even if we don't agree with the way they're pursuing them. Um, but it can be this very, it, it preys on fear, it creates an enemy, and then it gives a battle plan for how to go forward, and then it attaches people to this really sort of high-level cause that feels kind of good, like I'm courageous, I'm prepared to give up my life, I'm going to defend my country from, you know, whatever these speculative forces are. So I was looking at them, and then on the left side, I was looking at this collective called um, Hashtag Not White, and this is a group of artists <coughs> in Pittsburgh, and in their words, they say, we work to decolonize our minds and spaces through a non-hierarchical love ethic we fashion tools out of honesty, empathy, and vulnerability so that we may create and exist as our full, authentic selves in dignity, always growing and transcending. Uh, they talk about their exhibit, wanting to build bridges of love and compassion, all so that we can live as our full, authentic selves. And then it says at the end of their mission statement, we welcome you into our world, um, which feels slightly possessive. <laughs> I also discovered, though I couldn't find it again, that you can't be a man and join this group. Not because they want a space for women to connect, which I would respect, but because men uh, pretty much are bad. So, um, although they argue that they want to create a world filled with bridges of love, tucked right into their philosophy of group existence, is the exclusion of half population of the world just because they're men and until they I believe the words were exhibit a emotional revolution they didn't feel safe with guys around um, but that's not the primary issue the primary issue is that they're arguing that they are going to so their boogeyman is white supremacy um, that's kind of the their evil like they would probably say the Oath Keepers are a great example right of the bad guys and the tools that they're going to bring to the fight are their art, their ability to deconstruct things. It's really their, their words, their experiences, their lives as immigrants, their wives as people of color, particularly women people of color, uh, the sense that they're connected to the global majority. And so um, the higher cause, though, that they try to bring you into is the sense that uh, you can live your full, authentic self. Um, that that's possible, that we can find it, that we will be always, in their words, uh, moving forward, always transcending. So it has this sort of like spiritual, like rising up idea to it, right? If Oath Keepers are sort of a pushing out by force, this is sort of a rising up, um, a claiming who you truly are. It's very much self-definition, self-liberty. And so at the end of the day, these groups that seem to be very far apart are actually very much the same, right? Non-white um, really preys on fear. Uh, it wants to identify that there's one single sort of bad guy 
uh, white supremacy in America. It sees everything sort of through that lens. And therefore, um, it feels justified in its exclusions. It feels justified in its attacks. And what it really, it seems to me, would struggle to do is do what actually Christianity says of everyone, no matter their color, no matter their country of origin, no matter their gender, which is to say that um, the enemy is right here. Later, Paul writes that we are um, we're dead in our sins. And each of these groups, at some level, sees the deadness in other people, but they want to be the hero. And the only hero is Christ. And so Christians who sort of get pulled in either one of these directions, right or left, are not according to Christ. They're really running the risk of becoming captivated again, of being driven by fear, of looking for promises that only sort of exist at this personal level, this political level, this social level, of thinking that somehow when they find their authentic self, it'll be pure. <laughs> You could find your authentic self uh, prepare to be disappointed, right? I was pretty disappointed. The more I find my authentic self, the more I'm like, man, I authentically need Jesus Christ. Um, and so that's kind of where I'm going to close it. Uh, the warning was there. Paul says, see to it that no one takes you captive. So I think the warning stands before us in a very polarized culture where the stoicheia of our day kind of takes often these political shapes or these advocacy shapes to say if they're not according to Christ they only uh, enslave us all over again and we've been freed from fear and we're no longer debtors and we know that the hero is Christ and that is a path of faith that allows us to address issues of freedom of injustice of a real oppression without reading everything through the wrong lens. Well, we're back. That was kind of long, but it was kind of complicated. So hope you have a great afternoon and feel free to leave comments. See ya.